Uh, I mean, power started, I would say, almost seven years now. And we saw the trend or we saw the direction of the world going into renewable power. Um, people were concerned of the climate change, of the uh, carbon impact and the emission impact and started to consider the green power or the clean tech power. We started our first move in two countries, Egypt and Jordan, proximity, language, relationship in these two countries have uh, took us took us that, to that direction. Uh, we started with a 50 megawatt wind and 50 megawatt solar in Jordan, which is today in operation, uh, doing a very, uh, it's very uh, successful operation. Uh, we then looked at Egypt. Uh, Egypt is a big market in need of power. And the renewable resources in Egypt is top as well, the wind, solar. So we signed the MOU to develop uh, 1000 megawatt of wind and solar, which I'm proud to say we have celebrated the financial closure of these two projects recently. And we started construction. Uh, these two projects are our two biggest projects, 500 megawatt of wind in the Ras Gharb, Ras Gharb area on the Red Sea and the 500 megawatt solar in Aswan. Uh, these two projects have been financed by IFC, which is a subsidiary of the World Bank, FMO in Holland and JICA in Japan for the solar project. And for the wind project, JPEG of Japan and IFC, together with Mitsui Sumitomo Corporation Banking Corporation, Mitsui Sumitomo Trust Banking Corporation, and Standard Charter Bank. All these banks, together with JPEG, have funded our wind project. This is how we started in Egypt. In Jordan, I mentioned the two projects were financed by, one was financed by IFC and Islamic Development Bank, and the other was financed by FMO from Holland and DEG of Germany. Subsequent to that, we started uh, observing that Africa as a continent is a continent in need of power. Africa need to spend roughly under $200 billion of investment in the renewable space for the African continent. Africa is underserved in power. The average consumption of power per capita is very low in comparison to the developing world and in even in comparison to the emerging world. We saw these as opportunities. In addition, Africa has rich resources in terms of wind resources or solar radiation resources. So um, I've started in, I remember very well, in um, February 2019, when I embarked on a major tour trip, visiting different African countries. Uh, Togo was one country where we saw has that potential. We were welcomed there by the leadership of Togo. They needed uh, an immediate power of 30 megawatt solar in the northern part of the country, in Blita. So we started with 30 megawatt, which was then increased to 50, and now increased to 70. And we also added battery storage, which is the first time they do this in West Africa. And that plant, in fact, today is the largest in West Africa, at 70 megawatt. We have developed that in record time. Uh, was about 14 to 15 months, which have attracted attention to many other African countries. When they saw what we delivered in Togo, they realized this company is serious. This company can deliver 
and they have deliver, delivered. We financed the project in Togo, which is, we called it Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed uh, Solar Park, named after His Highness, the President of the United Arab Emirates. Abu Dhabi Fund have supported us there with several loans together with West African Development Bank. So the funding, uh, the debt provision was made through these two institutions and EMEA Power pulled full equity. Um, we succeeded in Togo. Our philosophy in working on these countries and in these villages is what I call partnership with the community. That is our theme. The community of Blita, where our project is, we hired their men and women, trained them to work with us first at the construction site and subsequently in the operation. We have fulfilled their community needs, whether building schools or building medical clinic, something they lacked. We did that and we provided 70 megawatt of solar power in that community, which is connected to the grid and the neighboring uh, villages. That's the philosophy in which we have started our mission. That have opened doors for us in other countries. Our philosophy was to move in to these countries as fast as we can. We saw the opportunities, we needed to grab these opportunities. So Burkina Faso was another country, Mali was another country where we have embarked on developing solar power as well. In fact, in Burkina Faso, the project is under construction as we speak. It was funded by IFC and Emerging Africa. In Mali, we are finalizing the needed legislative and the needed documentation to hopefully to move on fast, to move on soon. Um, we then looked at East Africa. Uh, Uganda was a country where we saw there is a potential. Uh, we have signed the uh, power purchase agreement for 20 megawatt in West Nile, Arua village. Uh, we are finalizing the necessary steps to move forward with this project. We hope to start construction at the beginning of 2023, and that will take us another 14, 15 months. The West Nile area is in need of power. Uganda has a good solar resources and a strong leadership and a strong uh, legal legislation. We then looked at Kenya. Kenya is a country in need of power, as a country with big potential. It's in the heart of East Africa. We are now developing a 50 megawatt wind project and we're contemplating developing solar projects as well with battery storage. We believe in Kenya potential. We also are now in advanced discussion in Ethiopia. Ethiopia has a very good wind resources. So we are trying to close the deal there in developing 300 megawatt of wind in Ethiopia. We're looking at Zambia. Zambia is a very promising country. We have a discussion going on on 150 megawatt in Zambia. We have just signed an MOU on Malawi, another 50 megawatt of solar. We have signed an MOU in Angola, 150 megawatt of solar. And we are just now starting to complete the technical studies in order to start on discussing the power purchase agreement. East Africa and Southern Africa are, re, uh, as a part of Africa, we are also keen on. There is a lot of potential there. We have also uh, been several times to South Africa. South Africa is in desperate need of expanding the power capacity. They are talking about 10,000 megawatt of, of need in renewable. We have bid uh, in an internationally announced tender in South Africa where many companies have participated in this bids. EMEA Power have bid, and EMEA Power has been selected to one of other companies, to uh, the successful bidder of 125 megawatt of solar power in South Africa. Um, we are also looking at Mozambique. 
uh, in southern Africa. Um, so the east and south African part, we are quite keen on. In particular, there is a big potential of connectivity. The South African power pool called SAP and the East African power pool are both, if you are in one of these countries, you can sell power to other countries by using that grid through a mechanism which they are adopting. In our strategy, we're going to invest along this line to be able to sell power to the East and Southern Africa through the respective pools. And these countries are in need of power to grow. In North Africa, I mentioned to you already Egypt, but more importantly as well, we have one in a competitive bidding uh, tender in Tunis, 100 megawatt of solar power, which is being financed by IFC and the African Development Bank. Oh, we talked about uh, Morocco is another country. We closed the financing of a 30 megawatt in Tangier region where we have again through a competitive bidding process one two solar project each is 35 megawatt so that's a 70 megawatt and we are looking at wind as well uh, in morocco for a 100 megawatt uh, so in north africa egypt tunis and morocco were quite active in west africa togo uh, burkina faso mali we're also looking at other countries like Senegal, Benin, Guinea. And I mentioned to you already um, East Africa and Southern Africa. So the, the focus we have, as the name indicates, MES stands for Africa, Middle East and Asia. So far, we have been focusing on Africa and Middle East. We believe in the potential of this big continent. Uh, and obviously, we are coming from the Middle East. so. It's our home as well. So that's in a nutshell the, the, the history of EMEA in summary. I think, f first of all, the need is there big time. Africa is in need of power. If you compare the average consumption or the average, average connectivity is lower than any other continent in the world. Uh, so the need is there. Africa is rich, rich in resources, rich in people. Uh, they have agriculture wealth, they have mining wealth, they have people wealth. So that continent is in need of power and to exploit their resources, they need power. One of the best African statements I heard from the president of African Development Bank addressing a group of African presidents. He says, he says to them, if you need power, if you want to stay in power, you need to give power. So Africa is in need of power. Everybody knows that. So the potential is there. Now, where is the challenge? The challenge is transforming that potential to reality. And that comes with execution. So execution where people fail. Um, you need to raise finance, whether it's debt or equity, and you need to have a strong capacity in delivering, building it through construction, through procurement, through engineering, and you need to have capacity in operating and maintaining whatever you build. I am proud of my team in EMEA Power. We have about 70 people in this organization who are committed, who work around the clock, who delivered and showed delivery to everybody. Um, so for anybody to succeed, you have to have a vision. And you have to have a leadership who can transform the vision to reality. And you need to have a team who would execute in that vision. And I'm proud of my team, proud of the people I have with me in EMEA Power. And we work hard. So working hard is very important. We don't take no for an answer. That's another thing. And we get in the plane and go to visit challenging geography, challenging methodology of, of reaching these countries. Some of the countries we work on have no connectivity. 
and some of the region of the area we work on has difficult transportation uh, capacity. So we work hard, we don't take no for an answer, we are devoted, we are dedicated, and we are honest, and we deliver on what we promise. And if we cannot do it, we say, sorry, we cannot do it. That's very important. And people respect you for that. People respect you if you, are, if you deliver. People respect you if you say, sorry, I can't do it. They know there is a problem there. Uh, we have also worked on regional bases and regional people. So if we talk about uh, Uganda or Kenya, we have regional men on the ground. We have boots on the ground. We have presence there. If we talk about North Africa, we have an office in Morocco with people who are not only focusing on Morocco, but they are also connecting to West Africa, which has a good proximity to Morocco, good connectivity to Morocco. So being there is very important. You cannot run a business by by being only in one location. Uh, you need to be present on the different geography you work on. And that's what we do. That's true, but I will not say access to finance. Finance is available. It is bringing the wish to reality. The problem is the financial institution are extra cautious. They need to make sure the debt is provided to a serious developer, to a country who can pay their obligation, and therefore the necessary guarantees should be there. And that takes time and slow in process, and hence the lack of delivery in Africa. So sometimes we take the risk by when we believe in the, when we have confidence in the leadership of a particular country, when we have confidence that this country needs to deliver power, we take a risk on advancing our cash and not wait for the debt to come. Um, we have done it twice now to deliver, but the debt is available. Finance is available more than people think. There are so many different financial institutions around the world who have um, a basket available for projects in Africa and renewable in particular. They just need to make sure that the other side of the, of the coins are ready and equipped and correct in dealing with that requirement. So um, that is a challenge we see. And, you know, DFI or Development Financial Institution, as they are known, they are, they are extremely cautious. They need to see seriousness on the developer side and on the government side. And if they don't, they will not then move on. We have not worked on distributed solar. We have been focused on utility scale solar. And we have done some CNI as well. But CNI, you have, you have mining companies, you have industrial companies who are a big off taker. So that is something we are doing. Um, the challenge we are seeing these days is the increase in the prices of material, the increase in the prices of logistics. Um, that has impacted the return of the developer because if you have signed uh, a power purchase agreement with a certain competitive tariff and then it took a while to reach financial close and for you to start construction, that period has an impact of prices. We have seen panel prices going up. We have seen trackers going up. We have seen all materials going up. And the client doesn't want to recognize that because they say, I have signed with you this tariff this time. It's your business how to deliver it. So that has been happening. It's happening in many parts of the world. And developers like us have uh, been impacted. So, you know, how do you deal with that? What we have done was trying to group several projects in one, uh, in one go to be able to negotiate with supplier, with contractor, a better price as a bulk vis-a-vis -vis small projects. But this has been a challenge for sure. We uh, have um, we have been delivering on projects where we are being impacted with the tariff. Uh, our IRR has come down, our return has come down, but we are 
trying to mitigate many of these challenges uh, in order to be able to keep our heads above the water. Um, there is some pockets of finance available on a soft loan basis, lower interest basis. You know, interest has been going up, inflation has been going up, but there are some pockets where you can get concessionary finance or lower finance in order to compensate the, that increase in tariff prices. We have just been in COP27, Sharm Sheikh. I think the whole world was there and the whole world realized that energy transition is very important. You need to move from fossil energy to renewable energy. And in fact, uh, and during our presence in COP27, Abu Dhabi Fund, together with IRENA, have launched, have launched an energy transition fund where soft loans are granted to developers or to countries who are moving from fossil fuel to energy, energy uh, renewable energy. So the world is going there. We as EMEA Power are focused on clean energy. We will not touch HFO, diesel, thermal, coal for sure not. All that non-clean fuel we will not touch. We're focused on only clean tech. We believe in the green power and the clean power and the world is going that direction. Um, countries like Egypt, for example, they are rich in gas, so relatively with fuel, but they're opted for green power because we always sell that gas to the world and make money, whereas your natural resources are there free of charge. You have wind resources, you have solar resources, you don't need to pay for it. So that saves you the fuel cost. Um, the, the new businesses we are developing in EMEA Power today, we have we have embarked on the green hydrogen business and the green hydrogen project. And we have signed our framework agreement in Egypt to develop one gigawatt of electrolyzer. We are doing the same in some African countries, uh, north and east. So our new direction is toward green hydrogen. But green hydrogen has a challenge of transportation. So you need, you cannot easily transport green hydrogen. However, you can transport green ammonia by converting green hydrogen to green ammonia. Green ammonia is safe to transport. So in our strategic planning for this is this, is to convert green hydrogen to green ammonia and sell green ammonia to the world. We see that Asia, Europe are willing to buy the green ammonia. The question is the price. Uh, because it's costly, but you may need, I mean, you cannot have a green ammonia at the same price as gray ammonia. Um, uh, so, you know, that that's the price you pay or the premium you pay for clean energy. But the world is changing toward that direction. In EMEA Power, our philosophy, our strategy, focus on wind and solar, focus on the green hydrogen and, and develop CNI, or utility scale projects. We have uh, a new direction now of also going to water. Africa has scarcity of water. So we want to develop desalination, you're converting sea water to uh, portable water and using green power to help with that, using the reverse osmosis technology. This is something we just embarked on in Africa as well. So to, to summarize our three pockets of businesses within EMEA power is generating wind and solar power with battery storage, uh, whether to utilities or to CNI, um, develop green hydrogen to green ammonia and develop water using green power. In Togo, we have started already uh, battery storage to, uh, you know, the advantage of battery, there are two big advantages of, of battery storage. One is dealing with the intermittency of, of renewable power. It helps to stabilize the grid 
by providing battery storage. So it's very important for for challenges with the grid. And secondly, <coughs> prolonging the the number of hours you need because you know when you have solar only, you have limited hours of power. When you have wind only, you have limited hours of power. So battery storage prolong the number of hours where uh, renewable power can go on. And this is something we are very focused on in this organization. Our first uh, battery storage project has been in Togo. We are now looking at Kenya as another uh, location for battery storage. Uh, the potential Africa for renewable, the sky is the limit. So if you as the as developer have the patience, have the guts, have the commitment and and willing to accept some risks, then you go to Africa. Many people come to me and say, are you out of your mind? You know, there's big risk in Africa. There is a big challenge in Africa. Why do you go there? It's risky. It's challenging. But there are two objectives. One, as, an, as a developer, we need to develop power there. So it's a, there is a human obligation. And two, the return in Africa is better than the return in other countries, but the always return reflects risk as well. So the higher risk, the higher return. That's normal. But it has that potential, and we believe in it, and we're committed to it. I have other investment in many different sectors, as you are, like, you are right about this. What I like about this sector, two, two important issues. One, you are protecting the environment. It's a clean energy. You are not. You are. You are supporting the environment, supporting to fight pollution, to, to fight emission, carbon emission. And two, you serve a continent which has been forgotten about, which has been under focused on, and you serve people who need to have upgrade their standard of living. You cannot imagine the pleasure I get. When I go to see the village of Blita in Togo and see the happy faces of people who have finally have power. Their children go to school, there is power. Their citizens go to the clinic, there is power. That is a great feeling. I'm very proud of it.